Welcome, one and all. Welcome as, as to a, welcome to a small and enthusiastic crowd to a rumor of empathy in Heidegger. My name's Lou Augusta. I teach here at Argosy, the, uh, formerly the Illinois School of Professional Psychology. It's even still, even as we speak, ongoing. And I'm here to hold forth with a few ideas on empathy. I want to start with what I call my ultimate in authenticity. And I'm going to forward the slides here. You know, try not to be too much of the absent minded professor, but some of that is inevitable. Here we go. My, here, so here I am. This is the cover art from my book, Empathy in the Context of Philosophy. And my ultimate in, in authenticity, when I introduce myself to my colleagues. And I say, hi, my name is Lou Augusta. I'm the author of a book on empathy. That lands the wrong way. It ends up, I have learned through hard, difficult experience that that sounds like there's empathy over here by me, Lou, and over there by you, over there by Bonnie, over there by Annie, is chopped liver. There's a lack of empathy. I'm tell I mean you wouldn't you might or might not think that that's the case, but I'm conf I'm putting it on on the video. Put it on the video. I mean, I'm proud of my accomplishment. There's nothing wrong with that. And I especially have found with senior colleagues who shall in this instance, I really won't even go into who they are. They feel like they have to teach me something and show me something. It lands like it's arrogant. It lands unempathically. And I would be the first to acknowledge, hey, I've got a lot to learn. On a good day, I get all the way to empathy. On a less good day, I struggle, like everybody else, to be fully present, to not distract myself, right? It's, it's like I'm listening to the other person speak. Well, am I listening to the other person speak? Or am I listening to my opinion about what they're saying, right? That's the hazard, in which case I'm not fully present. So the goal, I mean, to paraphrase what empathy is and what it's about, I'm fully present with the other person. This is actually going to get repeated a couple of times. So that's my ultimate inauthenticity. And I'm cleaning that. Okay, so this is the project. And I can, good news, I can net it out for you. The title today was A Rumor of Empathy in Heidegger. So here's the strategy. 1927, Martin Heidegger, student of Edmund Husserl, phenomenologist. Heidegger publishes Being and Time. It's one of those, don't drop it on your foot. 300 pages, fairly dense. Uh, and he has a account of the structures of human existence. So technical term. We almost immediately start talking German. Dasein, human existence. This is, gets taken over into English. Dasein analysis, Dasein therapy, substitute human existence or human being. Okay, now it, it's a technical term, but work with it. And he, instead of categories, he says very concisely in trying to net it out, kind of the, the uh, high level version, that we apply categories to nature and we, things have properties, but human beings have these distinctions called existentials. And they're not really categories, they're ways of being. They're distinctions as to how human beings are designed. And he finds that there are four of them. Affectedness, being affected. In effect, being affected, being at the effect, being open to my environment. And talking German, he uses the German term Befindlichkeit. Befindlichkeit, this is not even a word in German. In German, the people say, wie befinden Sie sich? How do you find yourself? In effect, how's it going? How are you? It's a kind of, kind of deeper way of saying, what's up? You know, was ist los? Instead of saying, was ist los, we mean like, hey man, que pasa, what's happening? It's like, but really, how are you? 
How do you find yourself? We, human beings are open to the environment. That's Befinlichkeit. We have something like understanding of possibility. This term, verstehen, understanding, is very deep in the German language. There's a long tradition coming up through Karl Jaspers, Wilhelm Diltai, Max Weber, sociologist, philosopher, psychiatrist. So it's very resonant. Verstehen, understanding, and Heidegger shifts it in the direction, in an interesting, interesting way in the direction of what is possible for a human being. And that's not usually how we understand understanding. But, so be with that. Then finally, interpretation, Auslegung in German. To, to, to interpret means to lay something out, to spread out some distinctions. It's not yet even verbal. None of, the, none of this is verbal. It's a way of being. It's a way of living. I live my life like, I'm going to make something up now, not that this is the truth, that love is not possible with this man, my father, who I grew up with, who was so severe. Whereas, in fact, he just had a different way of showing his love. Right? So, it's a, it's a way of being. Uh, and, and we live in an interpretation. We live like, people really don't get me. Or, they get, or it's going to work out at the last minute, right? Those who are constantly preparing at the last minute. And often it works out and sometimes it doesn't, right? And then finally, a way that this gets articulated in speech. So the strategy of this project is to take these four distinctions. How, openness or affectivity, understanding of what's possible, interpretation, which is an unpacking of understanding, and a way this gets articulated, and shift it in the direction of empathy, and generate a Heideggerian analysis of empathy. And it looks like this. Empathy shows up as an affect, as a kind of distance, as a kind of respectful distance and engagement for the other person, and as a trace affect of what they're experiencing, as a sample of the other person's experience. That's the, that's the analysis. This, what something gets understood in that way that so I need I need more examples that um, oh let's see help me out here that people live in an understanding that you know in 1953 in Birmingham Alabama there were water fountains and public restrooms for white people and there were different ones for what were then called Negroes, people of color, African Americans. This was, this was the way people lived. And many black people understood that as the way they lived. And then at one point, a woman named Rosa Parks decided not to move to the back of the bus. That she thought of a new and a different and a dramatically different possibility. And a man named Martin Luther King decided that maybe the white merchants ought to be boycotted until Rosa Parks could ride in the front of the bus. And things got going. And a new possibility got created that wasn't even envisioned by many of the people. Now, that's very dramatic, right? It doesn't have to be that dramatic. It could just be, you know, it could just be something like, uh, it seems like you're angry, but actually you're frustrated. Right? The glass is half full or the glass is half empty. That's a stereotype, right? What's the possibility here? Is it half full or half empty? Well, yeah, exactly. A different way of describing it, which gets us to the interpretation in the form of speech, which in the case of empathy, and Heidegger has something to offer, the form of empathy, the form of speech, the form of language, the form of talking, in which empathy comes into language is as listening. So it's a paradox, right? To be empathic, I get quiet. It gets, a, it gets zen at this point. It gets zen. And many of the things that Heidegger says about human existence, not just about our empathy, are like zen koans, listening to the inner voice. And if you stop and listen, you can hear it. It's saying, what inner voice? What's that about? And so uh, that's, uh, that's an example. 
right? I mean, and we, we can't, and I was mentioning earlier, hey, there's a familiar face, come on in. I was saying earlier, right, I'm, instead of listening to the other person, sometimes I'm listening to my opinion of what they're saying, right? And that's the opposite. That doesn't go in the direction of empathy. That goes in the opposite direction. And so that distinction. So that's a short account, way short, of a Heideggerian interpretation of empathy. So the next, the next document, so fast transition, rapid transition out of that. And before I do so, questions or comments about that? That's a Heideggerian, and you can generate a whole analysis, and it includes vicarious experience, right? Include there the idea of vicarious introspection, Heinz Kohut, uh, understanding of possibility. You get there the human potential movement, where human beings are very much their potential, and naturally, there's a natural trajectory to develop and unfold. Uh, if we don't interfere, if we don't inhibit, if we remove the resistance, so interpretation of resistance, very classical, that's classical psychoanalytic at that point, move the interpretation of resistance and let the individual unfold. I'm not going to fix you, right? I mean, wouldn't that, would, well, that's like a fallacy, right? That there's something here that needs to be fixed. Now, if the plumbing is broken, call the plumber, of course, right? If the, if the, if the lights are out, call the electrician or call the, the electric company. But in, in terms of human interactions, people are whole and complete. They may, they're dealing with what they're dealing with. And it is a fallacy that, I mean, people will try to fix themselves, right? I mean, we have tips and techniques. In the realm of tips and techniques, it can be useful to consider things that are effective or ineffective. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? But what's missing from that is empathy. I, su I respectfully suggest. And then finally, how it comes into language. So it's a, it's a powerful, and, and I suggest, I mean, Heidegger scholars don't necessarily endorse that. As you, you know, he, there's, a, there's like a whole industry, a whole Heidegger industry. They wouldn't necessarily endorse this interpretation, but I'll tell you one thing for sure. In several places, Heidegger calls for a special interpretation of empathy. He calls for a special hermeneutic of empathy, where hermeneutic means interpretation. And this is implicit in his work. And so, at this point, I'm going to just let it be and say, uh, you know, questions, comments, because the next thing is, is itself interesting. I acknowledge you. Welcome. Uh, and uh, nice to see you again, I want to say. Ms. Clark. I got that right. Um, so we're just talking about uh, empathy. Uh, and um, there's a handout there, too, if you want. You can get the handouts. It, it, you don't have to, but, you know, before you leave. The next thing I want to do, if, with, so we have about five minutes left. And... and uh, unless you have any questions or, or anything. So don't feel, you know, uh, the next thing I want to do is give you an example of one of the Grimm's fairy tales about empathy. So there's a folk tale, and we covered this in that class that uh, I want to say, uh, Vanessa. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that Vanessa was in. You'll, this one will sound familiar to you. Uh, but there's a folk tale, one of the Grimm's tales. Is, a, is basically about empathy. The word does not occur. But if you, I think it's tale number 11. So, you know, this is like a trick question, like who's buried in Grant's tomb? Who wrote the Grimm's fairy tales? Right? It's not the Brothers Grimm. They were the editors. The fairy tales, the American, the folk tales, are anonymous, right? They, did, they collected them. They, they talked to, to the people, farmers and shopkeepers and whoever, whose parents had handed down, whose grandparents, whose great-grandparents had handed down these tales from one generation to another in oral tradition. So this story, the youth who went forth to learn what was fear, the youth who went forth, von einem der Auszug das Furchten zu lernen, one who went forth to learn fear. So it's a classic tale of a simpleton. This, <laughs> it's a young man, and uh, he is such a He's so dense. Let's just tell it like it is. This guy is so dense that when people are sitting around the fire uh, and talking about telling ghost stories, it's a classic ghost story, and they say, oh my God, that gives me the creeps. Oh my God, that makes me afraid. Oh my God, that's, that's really spooky. Oh my God, that you know, really, really gets me. It gives me the willies. He says, I wish I knew what that was. I wish I knew what that was to get the creeps. I wish I knew, knew what that was to be afraid. When I grow up, I'd like to earn my living. 
by getting the creeps. And at this point, his father puts his head in his hand, right, and rocks back and forth. Oh, my God, I'm going to have some trouble. And so this fellow is so defended against feeling and emotion that he doesn't even experience fear. If you don't experience fear, you don't experience anything. It's primordial, it's fundamental, it's basic, right? Okay, so that's basically the story. He goes through a lot of adventures, which are basic, it culminates in a really creepy scene. He spends three nights in the haunted castle, right? And there are dogs and cats with red hot eyes. They're obviously from hell. And he deals with all that. It's very simple, very simple. These guys bring in a coffin. He says, oh my God, it's my cousin who passed away. Dear cousin, wake up, wake up. The cousin doesn't wake up. He gets in bed with the corpse to wake it up, to warm it up. Creepy. It gets creepier. The corpse wakes up and says, now I'm going to strangle you. But he deals with it. He's strong. He's not afraid. He keeps his wits about him. The guy's dead. He's not very strong. He puts him back in. Da -da -da. The curse on the castle is raised. He gets the treasure and the princess of the hand of the princess, the treasure hard to attain, right? And the hand of the princess and a third of the treasure, a third of the treasure to the crown, a third of the treasure to the poor, a third of the treasure to him. He gets the princess. They're, the morning after their wedding, they're lying in bed. So fast forward, quick break. Wake up the next morning. He says, wow, that was great. I wish I knew, but I, there's only one thing I regret. I wish I knew what it was to get the creeps. The chambermaid happens to have come in at this time and takes the fishbowl with a bottle, with a bowl of water with little fishes, goldfish, and you want to know the creeps? Here, psh, she throws it on him. The fishes go flap, flap, flap. He says, oh my God, oh my God, I've got the creeps, I've got the creeps, goose flesh, right? Ah, now at last I know what it is to get the creeps. So he discovers that without empathy, he is not fully human. Empathy, the ability to experience emotion in this interpretation, is required for our full, complete humanity. Without that, our humanity is incomplete. Thus, the story of the youth who went forth. So it's a pre-ontological document. The folk, the folk, the people, you know, the, 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 the people telling folk tales. There ain't many more of those around, right? But in the day, the 200 Grimm tale know about that. And it, there it's documented. So, so I offer that for your consideration. Thank you. John Henry He says a man ain't nothing but